Hello, good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to our webinar uh, this afternoon. David Rouse is my name, advisor with the Housing uh, Agency. Uh, delighted to be uh, collaborating today with the Construction Bar Association of Ireland on our webinar in relation to uh, legal changes in the uh, high density and multi unit development uh, sector. We have a pretty uh, packed uh, program uh, for you this afternoon. Uh, our panelists are uh, with us indeed. Uh, we have um, Patricia Burke, uh, Anita Fanukin, Memma Byrne, and Deirdre Nguyen, and I will introduce them um, shortly. In the meantime, um, while people are logging in, um, as they are uh, fairly rapidly, I'm going to run a poll. Uh, and this is an anonymous poll. And it really is just to understand your um, your relationship or your involvement, your role in the uh, in the housing uh, construction or legal sector. So I'll launch that poll now, and would be grateful if you could please let us know your uh, your involvement with the sector. That is uh, essentially an anonymous poll, and uh, we can, um, uh, as I say, it's really just to get a sense of our audience uh, this afternoon, and uh, that would be uh, very helpful um, for uh, for the moment. And in the meantime, some of our panelists are just logging in with us in the background, so thank you um, for that. And in due course, I will ask them to uh, to join uh, to join in uh, and turn their cameras on, but uh, not for the moment. So, as I say, this is an anonymous poll, so it'd be grateful if you could perhaps just indicate your uh, involvement uh, in the sector. Um, and uh, it will just help us uh, for plan future events uh, indeed as well. So thank you very much. I'll let that run for another uh, couple of uh, couple of seconds. So you're all very good to have uh, to have voted uh, and to let us know. As I say, it is indeed um, an anonymous uh, anonymous poll. So feel free to uh, to share your uh, your role in the uh, in the sector. Thank you very much indeed for that. So I'll stop that poll now. Thank you for all of you who have uh, who have voted. And uh, that's uh, I say that's very useful to to uh, understand. And uh, I will um, share that in due course with our uh, with our speakers. So let me uh, share my screen now with you briefly, uh, and we'll go through some housekeeping for this afternoon's uh, for this afternoon's um, session. And uh, just by way of uh, timetable, we will uh, endeavour to start our presentations proper at uh, 10 past uh, 12. I'm going to do a little introduction just uh, on what's new in the multi-unit development high density sector. We will endeavour to have a Q&A about a quarter to one, give or take, um, uh, allowing for time overruns, etc. And we'll wrap up and close, ideally by, uh, by one o'clock. Uh, if you want to uh, receive a copy of the slides or have any other queries outside of this session, please do contact us, mod.housingagency.ie. By way of housekeeping as well, if uh, for the Q&A session, please use the, uh, the Zoom Q&A function. I'm sure you'll all be relatively familiar with it at this, uh, at this stage. If you have any problems with the tech, please use the chat function. And uh, my colleagues, Sarah Kennedy and Katrina Lawler are in the background and they're keeping an eye on that for us. So if there's any problems, um, they, will, uh, they will assist us with, with that and they'll answer your queries on a technical front with sound or vision. Just to note, the session is being recorded for, uh, for future um, use. Um, and uh, I'll say, please contact us, mod.housingagency.ie for a copy of the slides. As you know, uh, COVID-19 is dominating our, uh, our existences at the moment. And we would say that uh, for all information on the current status on public health guidelines and restrictions, please do log on to uh, the gov.ie website uh, where you'll get uh, all the information you need uh, on current, uh, current restrictions and arrangements. And we hope indeed you're keeping well and managing through the current turbulence, difficult, a difficult time indeed, especially for for the people of Donegal and Dublin at the moment. But uh, as I say, you can get the, uh, the details there. A little bit about the housing agency. We are under the aegis of the Department of uh, Now Housing, Local Government and Heritage. Our offices uh, in normal times indeed are on uh, Mount Street, just off Merrion Square. And we work with stakeholders, including the local authority sector, approved housing bodies uh, and other stakeholders in the sector. And again, we're very grateful to the Construction Bar Association for their uh, collaboration uh, this afternoon in what should be uh, a, a very full, uh, a very full session. Uh, a little bit about some of our uh, presenters. I think we have uh, Martin Waldron with us at the moment. Um, and Martin will speak for the uh, for the Construction Bar Association. So we're grateful for Martin's time. Our our key presenters are um, uh, Memma Byrne, who will be familiar to many of you in her expertise in the property 
uh, land law, landlord and tenant and company law sectors and uh, MEMA is an adjudicator with the uh, with the RTB. So grateful to MEMA for her availability. We have with us indeed as well, Anita uh, Fanukin, who is uh, a member of the Bar Council and chair of the Young Bar uh, Committee and uh, is, is uh, practices in the area of common law. Uh, Chad three non-jury matters and construction law. So indeed, thanks to, to Anita, who, who will be speaking um, shortly. Patricia Burke is with us as well. Indeed, Patricia's uh, area of practice is land law, commercial uh, landlord and tenant law, uh, commercial disputes uh, and uh, probate and trust. So grateful for Patricia's time as well. Quick run through on what's new uh, in the sector uh, from ourselves, what, what the housing agency is up to. You may have seen our uh, Apartment Living in Ireland 2019 report published last week, which is effectively a, a residential satisfaction survey on, um, on apartment dwelling and it's available on our website for you to consult. Lots of uh, interesting findings in uh, in that. So we'd encourage you to maybe access that. Uh, as you may be aware, we have lots of information and resources for the multi-unit development sector, in particular, the guidance published with the SCSI and IPAV uh, for multi-unit developments and owners management companies. You may have seen that the uh, Department of Communications, uh, Climate Action and Environment published the Waste Action Plan for a Circular Economy about two weeks ago. And there are indications of changes perhaps to uh, planning law in respect of uh, providing facilities, enhanced facilities for apartments and uh, so on for uh, waste segregation and recycling that might be of interest. Uh, on the company law side, many of you will be aware of the company's miscellaneous provisions COVID-19 Act, which was um, brought into force by ministerial order on the, commenced rather on the 21st of August, allowing people to undertake uh, company AGMs and voting online. Uh, and as recently as last week, I can see that there were uh, about uh, 15 or 16 new owners management companies incorporated um, over the last couple of weeks since the start of September. So welcome measure indeed. You may have seen the extension of the pyrite remediation scheme to the uh, county and city of Limerick last week and um, some indications in terms of um, the examination of defective uh, housing and a review of management company law. So that's, I think, something from the Programme for Government that may be of interest. Just to acknowledge uh, a useful resource that's available, I think it's, it's, uh, it's on a free share platform from FP Logan uh, Company Solicitors, which is an SHD tracker, a very uh, useful um, uh, piece of, of information on their website where you can uh, access in some detail uh, the uh, SHD process. Some quick figures on residential construction uh, and, and apartments. You can see obviously the impact that COVID-19 has had at the drop off. This is information from the CSO a couple of weeks ago uh, in relation to Q2 of 2020. Um, and you can see on the left hand side the, uh, the graph with the green line dropping off uh, if you like, um, uh, when uh, works were, were suspended um, and equally the, the uh, output per quarter is there as well. Taking a more um, uh, sort of uh, long range view over the last 20 years, you can see that apartments and high density um, dwellings have, have outpaced conventional houses in terms of, of planning permissions, um, most recently 2019, 2020. And indeed you can see from the CSO applications that while apartment, um, uh, while apartment planning approvals dropped off, uh, in, in the context of COVID-19, the, uh, the orange or yellow line uh, indicates that apartment uh, planning trends are, are well ahead of conventional housing. So uh, interesting to note that. And you can um, look at what the CSO released the week before last in that respect as well, that uh, while there has been a drop off on the left hand side in terms of apartments, it is considerably lower than the conventional housing stock. In terms of uh, what, uh, what is happening um, in, in uh, the COVID situation in the wider context of what's going on in in the world and over history. This is a slide you may have seen before on some of our earlier webinars, that when public health authorities get on top of public health concerns, people do flock back to cities and to areas of, of high density uh, dwelling, if you like. So this shows the population of New York uh, on the uh, x-axis uh, over the, uh, over the uh, period from the early 1800s to uh, 1950. And you can see that the population of New York went from um, uh, in the hundreds of thousands up to seven or eight million and whatever it is today, but marked by all those public health um, uh, turbulences, if you like, over the period, cholera, influenza and so on. So I suppose sometimes we maybe the collective memory might not stretch back and this is a reminder of, of, of uh, I suppose, context for high density dwelling. So um, I will um, remind you of our contact email audithousingagency.ie. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand over, I think, to uh, 
to Martin Waldron or Deirdre Neeline, whoever perhaps um, steps in first to uh, give some introductory remarks for uh, the Construction Bar Association. And uh, I would ask uh, them to uh, turn on the camera and unmute themselves, please. That would be great. And while they're doing that, I'd remind you to uh, contact us at mod at housingagency.ie. So I think Martin, David, it's Mark, it's Martin Waldron here. I'm trying great. to uh, put the video on, but you have Perfect, disabled Martin. it. So I'm quite happy to uh, remain as a dark screen. That doesn't Excellent. upset me on dearly. Thank you. Okay, um, let's, on behalf of the Construction uh, Bar Association, I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's event. Construction Bar was set up uh, as an association of Irish lawyers, uh, both solicitors and barristers, with an interest in construction law and practice. Uh, it was established in 2013 to promote kind of the knowledge uh, of construction law and construction disputes, and really to facilitate the sharing of the expertise and to act as a hub for members in the area of this uh, law practice and dispute resolution, because most of this law is done outside the courts, so we don't have uh, precedents to work from. So that was the primary purpose of it and also to promote the members. The benefits of membership include access to our uh, technical talks program, the Christmas and summer lectures, which unfortunately uh, haven't happened this year, but have been a great success to, to date, uh, and the annual construction law conference, which has been a absolute massive success for the organization. We also have an online codex containing uh, 90 member papers with an excess of 90 member papers on construction law and dispute resolution in the jurisdiction. So uh, we're delighted to partner with the housing agency uh, for this presentation. And I would like to thank David and the team at the agency for facilitating the organizational and technical side of today's event. I would also like to thank uh, fellow committee member Deirdre Neflin, who arranged today's event with the housing agency and then unfortunately found herself engaged in court due to her uh, thriving uh, practice and uh, is unable to attend. We will be looking at three highly topical issues of relevance to practitioners, um, legal practitioners, property management professionals and anyone involved in the supplier maintenance of housing in Ireland. It's often the case that legal developments mirror what is happening in the wider economy and society. And strategic housing developments have only been a feature of our housing landscape for a little over three years. But in that time, over 15,000 units have been approved under the process. My colleague, Mema Byrne, is going to speak to us about some of the challenges those applications have faced before the courts. And the next topic, uh, not necessarily in this order, uh, relates to the Multi-Unit Development Act, which came into force uh, nearly 10 years ago to deal with problems in housing uh, and apartment developments. But at the same time, title and common area disputes continue to present very difficult problems for practitioners and for developers. And Patricia Burke, uh, another colleague of ours, will look at how those issues can be addressed and regularized. And the first speaker will be on building defects and property damage claims, which are a constant source of disputes, as we would all know. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague Anita Fanukin to discuss the impact of the statute of limitation on those claims, a very topical issue, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this. Okay, Anita. Thanks very much, Martin, and thank you very much to the Housing Agency and to David Rouse for organising today's event and to Deirdre as well. Um, the purpose of my paper today is really to talk about the statute of limitations in light of a very important decision which was given by the Supreme Court in 2018. Um, I've previously given a paper on this topic, but it's still very relevant today in the context of industry practitioners, whether or not you're bringing a claim, but more importantly for those of you listening in today, if you're defending a claim. So really what I propose to do for the purposes of today's talk is to discuss Branley and Dean um, to discuss the manner in which the court will measure the statute of limitations and decide when a claim starts to run for the purposes of the statute of limitations under section 11 of the statute of limitations act and then I'm just going to briefly refer to some of the legislative developments in the UK and how arguably there's uh, certainly a need I think in Ireland in the construction sphere to maybe lobby the government for the same type of legislative intervention that has occurred over there so that claims like this can't be brought in an in kind of indefinite um, period of time. Um, so for those of you um, who are familiar with the Branley and Dean decision, um, it was given by the Supreme Court in 2018. 
And prior to the Brandy and Dean decision, if you wanted to advise a person as to how long they had to take a claim, um, you would be referring them to Section 11, uh, 2A of the Statute of Limitations Act 1957. And that section provides that an action founded on tort, which is negligence to you and I, um, that can't be brought after the expiration of six years from when the cause of action accrues. Now, that might sound very straightforward. Um, it, it, in fact, it has been applied very straight in a very straightforward man manner where personal injuries are concerned owing to legislative intervention which describes what the date of knowledge is but where property damage claims are concerned that um, the interpretation of that has caused particular difficulty before the courts because and, and that's particularly the case where latent damage is concerned so prior to Branley the six-year period in tort ran from the date of damage which led to a kind of buyer beware mentality and probably an objectively unfair situation for housing owners and um, particularly those who were buying second-time properties who might have had less structural knowledge of what had come before them and um, so in Branley and Dean the court had to decide well when when exactly does a cause of action accrue does it occur when does the six years start to run when the damage occurred or does it occur at a later stage when the damage has manifested and when it's capable of being discussed Discovered. And ultimately, unfortunately, to, to give away the, the result, but it's ultimately the latter point that the court decided that the six year period runs from. So um, in order to understand that, it might seem very straightforward to say, well, you know, that's the principle, the six year runs from the date in which um, the damage becomes manifest. And that might sound straightforward, but I think it's important maybe to go into the Branley and Dean decision in a little bit more detail to understand how the court have applied it, because there have been quite a few decisions up until Branley and Dean where the damage and the defect were treated as being or as occurring on the same date. And Branley actually makes a very clear distinction between damage and defect for the purposes of triggering that time limitation under the statute of limitations. So I'm just going to give you a bit of background as to the Branley and Dean decision. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of it. Um, certainly you should be aware of it because it is important from the point of view of liability of industry practitioners. So in Branley, the plaintiff was a property developer and they sued uh, two defendants and the first defendant was their consulting engineer and the second was a contractor and they sued them in contract and in negligence um, and the, engin the engineer and the contractor had laid the foundation of a small terrace of houses on a common raft foundation in Williamstown in County Galway and the proceedings were commenced over six years um, after the laying of the foundations and in fact it was over six years after the dates of certificates of compliance in the case. Um, so it's important just to be aware maybe of what the relevant timeline is in the case. So the foundations were completed in March 2004. Uh, certificates of compliance with planning permission and building regulations were issued on the 4th of September 2004 by the first named defendant. Uh, the houses were completed in January, February 2005, and the cracks were observed in both houses in December 2005. And then the proceedings were commenced on the 30th of November 2010. So obviously, um, from the plaintiff's point of view, their case was quite clear. We only saw the cracks in December 2005. We issued our proceedings in November 2010. We're very clearly within the six year time frame to bring the proceedings. The defendant's case, and in particular the first named defendant who was the engineer, had said that the, the negligence certification of the foundations had actually been given at a much earlier stage um, back in 2004. And for that reason, um, the six year period had expired and the case was statute barred. So the plaintiff uh, instituted the proceedings against the defendant in negligence and contract and the issue of whether the case was statute barred was tried as it normally is by way of preliminary issue in litigation like this, where the issue of the statute of limitations is clearly in dispute. And what the court had to determine was how they were going to apply section 11 of the statute of limitations act and decide the question of when, whether or not, or when the cause of action had accrued. Um, so the defendant um, obviously gave evidence that um, the foundations were defective from March 2004 when the foundations were completed and they said that the six year period had expired and the High Court in fact found for the defendants um, at first instance on the trial of the preliminary issue and noted that a discoverability test didn't apply in property cases and negligence so um, the more or less the High Court agreed with the defendant and said that the damage was synonymous in that case with the time with the defect occurred and because the defect had occurred as acknowledged by the first named defendant who admitted liability as that had occurred back in September 2004 then the six-year period had expired um, so it's important I think 
the, the Branley decision is important because um, it, it remained consistent with the stream of Irish case law that discoverability tests do not apply in relation to the statute limitations where property damage is concerned. Um, in other words, what the court very clearly said is that you don't have to wait until the, the damage is discovered um, for the clock to start running. And what happened in the High Court, um, again, was the court went back and referred to a number of decisions which had predated Branley. Um, and a lot of those decisions were very arguably objectively, I, you could say they were quite unfair from the point of view of the homeowners. Um, and the discoverability test had created quite, quite a lot of confusion um, in the industry because um, I think maybe there had been a perception that up and that the damage didn't, uh, or that the clock didn't start to run um, until um, uh, when the damage occurred and when the defect occurred and that in other words the six-year period occurred or would start to run from the date of the defect and that's because there were a number of decisions decided prior to Branley which in essence made this clear and you might be familiar with some of these the first one is the Irish Equine Foundation in Robinson and in that case uh, the uh, Equine Centre was built with the final certificate issuing in November 1987 and water started to leak through in 1991 and the proceedings issued in 1996 and the plaintiff argued in that case that the six-year period ran from the site of the leaks in 1991 but the court had rejected that and the court specifically said in that decision which is now 20 years old that discoverability cannot be relevant in calculating the commencement date of the limitation period and again the high court back then applied the Pirelli decision which is very well known um, from industry practitioners and Judge Gagan said that if the roof was defectively designed this would have been manifest at any time to any expert who examined it and the damage was there for caused at the date of construction rather than at the date of the leaks. Um, so in simple terms, if the damage had manifested on the structure, irrespective of whether or not it had in fact been discovered, then the clock had started to run at that point. So again, the Irish Equine Foundation was relied on by lawyers and by engineers and architects and con um, construction workers alike as a basis for saying that generally speaking, we were of the view that the six year period ran um, from when the time that the damage had occurred. And there was other decisions to back that up until Branley. The, the Murphy and McInerney Construction Limited is a decision of misjustice done. And in that case, the plaintiffs had purchased a second-hand property in Paris Court in County Waterford in 1997. And they had relied on a structural survey, which was prepared by the second named defendant. Um, but they weren't aware a year prior to purchasing the property in 1996 that structural works had been carried out um, to mend structural defects in the home. And the plaintiff didn't, in fact, discover the defects until 2000 when a further inspection was carried out and they didn't bring their proceedings in negligence and breach of contract uh, until 2004. And again, the question that the court had to determine was whether the negligence proceedings had been brought within that six year uh, time frame uh, where the latent defect had been discovered after the damage had manifested in 1996. And Judge Dunn found that the proceedings themselves were statute barred. And she said that she pointed out the damage was not of recent origin, that the damage had occurred in 1996, a year prior to the purchasers actually acquiring the home. And Judge Dunn took the view that even if the defect was not discovered until 2000, time began to run from when the damage happened and not from when it was discovered. And she indicated the time running from when latent defects became manifest uh, was nothing short of a discoverability test. And uh, up until Branley, we were all of the view, I think, that a discoverability test didn't apply. Now, Branley and Dean, in somewhat complicated fashion, says that that is still the case. The discoverability test doesn't apply. Um, but there are three really important points um, in terms of Branley and Dean, um, in terms of how the, the Supreme or the Court of Appeal and then the Supreme Court decided when the six year period started to run. So the first point to be taken away from Branley and Dean is that in negligence as against any practitioner or any industry um, practitioner, whether it's engineers or architects or whatever, the cause of action exists uh, once the tort is complete. And in order for the tort of negligence to complete, there must be damage. So that's the first point to make. Um, and there's, there's a distinction, and the court draws this very clear distinction between the date of the wrongful act, the latent defect and the damage. So if you use incorrect materials which give rise to a latent defect, there is no cause of action if there's no damage resulting from the incorrect use of the materials and the tort is not complete. So the first thing that has to be made out by anyone who's defending a professional negligence action is that uh, the, the tort itself is complete and time will run from the discovery um, of the latest of these events, which is when the physical damage itself occurs. 
But it's not just when the damage itself occurs, um, it's when the damage itself has manifested. And that is the second point to take away from Branley and Dean, um, that the court said that the accrual of the cause of action occurs from when the damage is manifest. Now, this isn't the first time that we've heard the terminology of when damage is manifest. Judge Gagan used it and referred to it in the Irish equine decision. And damage is manifest, and this is probably the most important part, is the ratio of the decision, um, which is legal speak for uh, you know, the, the most relevant deciding factor. The damage um, uh, is manifest when it is capable of being discovered. So the clock will start to run from the date on which the damage is capable of being discovered. And the manifestation of damage is the proper start point in property damage cases and this means that the point of time at which damage is provable so in the court of appeal then and the supreme court reversed the high court um, decision in Branley, the high court decision which said it was statute barred and said it wasn't statute barred on the basis that the cracks had started to materialize um, in december 2005 and for that reason the case had actually been brought within time so it's probably this manifestation of damage that causes a lot of concern, I think, for industry practitioners, because on the one hand, we have a number of cases that say there's no such thing as discoverability for the purposes of triggering that six year period. And yet on the other side, we are told that it's the manifestation of damage, which is capable of being discovered, but not quite in fact discovered, that will trigger the time period. And unfortunately, and, and this is probably where I'm, I'm most lacking in terms of um, how the courts have interpreted this we don't have any decision applying Branley and Dean since 2018 um, to the extent that we know what it actually means for damage to be capable of discovery um, so an important point I suppose as well to make is that um, Mr Justice McKechnie in his judgment in relation to the discoverability test um, he pointed out that there is um, a distinction between the discoverability test and the manifest test, um, noting that the former imports an element of reasonableness to the plaintiff's ability to discover the, inj uh, the injury, uh, which is absent from the latter test. So if, there, if it is the case that discoverability or reasonableness is absent, is absent from the discoverability or the manifestation in the latter test, then it's the case that whether damage is capable of being discovered is something which will likely be determined by experts in litigation. Um, and that's something that seems to be or will be applied by the courts in an objective sense. Um, so no doubt that is going to um, add to the cost of litigation itself. And we, we wait to hear how it's going to be applied. Um, in terms of subsequent decisions that have applied Branley and Dean, in any real sense that has a bearing on what we're discussing today. Um, there's a Noble and Bonner decision by Miss Justice O'Regan in 2019, and that's a professional negligence claim. Um, and I'm only going to briefly mention it in that she applied Branley and she made the point that manifestation of damage is when it is capable of being proved. So again, this kind of implies that expert evidence would be very important in the context of negligence claims and construction disputes. Um, and a final point to make about the application of the statute limitations um, is that, particularly in the case of Branley, it's a highly fact-specific decision. And while some in this industry have heralded Brandley as being very pro-plaintiff, which no doubt it is, the decision, like all decisions on statute limitations, is highly fact-specific. So um, the damage that manifested in Brandley did so in a very, very clear way on the walls of an interior where it was capable of being discovered. Um, there are other decisions which have applied the very same reasoning and led to almost diametrically opposed results for the plaintiff where they haven't been able to recover. And an example of that is the Pirelli decision which again is mentioned by Mr Justice McKechnie in, uh, in, in Branley and Dean and Pirelli is a much older decision which now doesn't really bear much significance in, in English law because it has been replaced by English legislation. Um, but in Pirelli General, Cable Works Limited and Oscar Faber and Partners, in that case, damage in the form of cracks um, appeared on the outside of a 160 foot high chimney. And the cracks appeared over six years um, uh, before the writ had issued. And the House of Lords concluded that the cause of action accrued when physical damage occurred to the building when the cracks occurred at the top. And the actionable damage occurred when the cracks started to, in fact, appear on the chimney. And because of the location of the, the damage, it wasn't in fact capable of being discovered um, by anybody you know, reasonably within sight of it or in a practical sense. Um, and therefore, that was a, it's a good example of where the very same principles that applied in Branley could in fact lead to quite a harsh result uh, from the point of view of homeowners. So just a few concluding thoughts on Branley. Um, 
first of all, key to determining when the clock starts to run for um, anyone who's being sued in negligence for property damage is from the manifestation of damage. And by manifestation of damage, it is uh, manifest when it is capable of being discovered. Um, and no doubt the decision itself is very welcomed uh, by property purchasers and homeowners because it makes clear that you have six years to bring a claim, not from the date that the damage occurred, but from the date that the damage is capable of being discovered by you, uh, which more often, more often than not will be much later in time. Um, it's probably fair to say, I think, that the decision might be less warmly received by builders and contractors and those who are engaged in construction work because where damage manifests at a later date from its occurrence, then obviously exposure to liability can exist long after after the six year period. And in a sense, there's no clear boundary to when the exposure will cease from the defendant's point of view. Um, the decision also other commentators have made the point that uh, it highlights the need for runoff insurance um, amongst building professionals who potentially could be faced with claims and um, which might arise many years after certification. Um, the only comfort I think that can be offered to defendants who might fall on the wrong side of these cases is that it's still open to defendants in common law to bring pleas or to, to um, make pleas of inordinate and inexcusable delay in the context of their defences to strike out the plaintiff's claim. Um, but I also think that there is a point to be made and certainly um, that the Irish legislature should probably consider similar legislative uh, intervention um, as has occurred in the UK in terms of the Latent Damage Act 1986 and that sets out a statute period and um, very clearly in cases of property damage which is six years from the date of the accrual of the cause of action being raised and three years from the earliest date in which the potential claimant knew or reasonably ought to have known material facts necessary to bring an action alleging negligence uh, subject to an overall limit of 15 years from the accrual of damage and um, so again that's just to say that maybe that is something that might want to be considered i'm conscious that time is of the essence not just in terms of my paper but also in terms of um, the next presentation so thank you very much adita thank you very much for that fantastic exposition on on the uh bradley decision and recent uh, recent developments indeed time time is uh, on top of all of us so without further uh, input from me i'll hand over to um, Memma Byrne, who's going to update us on recent uh, SHD decisions. So thank you very much, Memma. Thank you, David. I'd like to thank you and the Housing Agency and my colleagues in the Construction Bar Association. I'm delighted to be speaking to you all this morning. I'm going to share a screen with you. Um, sorry, I don't know if I'm doing this correctly, am I? Can you all see that, David? Can you tell Spot me? Spot on, Bebe. Yeah, absolutely. That's if you great. just want to maximise it up to the to the full screen, perhaps that that'd be great. Is it maximised there? I think that's all I'm capable of doing. So I'll move on. Fine. Okay. What I'm going to talk to you about is strategic housing developments, which uh, were brought in under the Planning and Development Housing and Residential Tenancies Act, which I'm going to refer to as the 2016 Act that was brought in in 2017 for an initial period of two years, and that has now been extended until the end of 2021. The definition of strategic housing developments is in section three, and that is developments of 100 or more housing on land zoned for residential use, or a development of student accommodation, which contains 200 or more bed spaces, uh, on land, the zoning of which facilitates the provision of student accommodation, or a development that is a mix of either of those, or uh, an alteration of an existing planning permission uh, where the proposed alteration relates to the type of development set out there in A, B or C. So the planning process is different to the norming normal planning in that the application is made directly to on board Planola, which I have referred to as the board in most of these slides. And it is divided into two stages, pre-planning consultation, and then the planning application and the grant. Now, as all of you who are aware and are familiar with uh, planning legislation, it's very dense. So what I propose to do here is just to bring your attention to some of the provisions and to summarize them rather than go through them in detail. So applicants must first of all consult with the planning authority and that must comprise of at least one meeting um, and they must then invite the board to enter into consultations uh, with them in relation to the proposed development. 
the board will form and issue an opinion as to whether the documents that they've submitted uh, constitute a reasonable basis for an application under a st uh, strategic housing development or whether the documents are deficient. So they will go back to them and there will be some um, interaction between the proposed applicant or the applicant and the board. Uh, following the consultation, a proposed uh, a prospective applicant may request the board to make a determination in relation to whether the development is likely to have significant effects on the environment or is likely to have a significant effect on a European site. And they can request a written opinion in relation to that. Uh, as part of the pre-planning, uh, the chief executive of the planning authority is required to submit a report to, a report to the board in relation to the development uh, when the application is being made. And all the documents uh, that arose or were generated uh, in the pre-planning consultations between the developer and the local authority must also be made available to the board. So I have a number of slides, uh, I think there, where I go into more detail and I'm essentially going to skip them. That will show you there what the prospective applicant must submit in relation to their consultation. Uh, that sets out in a little bit more detail the time uh, limits surrounding uh, when one party must revert uh, to another and the requests that can be made uh, in terms of the report. The next thing that uh, needs to be addressed is the newspaper notice in respect of the planning application and that is dealt with under section 8. It is a fairly detailed section. I've set out for you there some of the things that must be included such as the number of housings, uh, the relevant planning authority, uh, that there's an intention to uh, seek planning permission, uh, the period from which um, a copy of the application and the relevant reports may be inspected. Um, there must also be a statement including uh, various matters such as how the application is consistent with the objectives in the development plan and how somebody may go about appealing the decision, etc. So they're very detailed and they need to be complied with. The planning application then itself is made directly to the board and under section nine, the board grants or refuses the decision and they must consider the report of the planning authority, any submissions that they received, any other relevant information insofar as it relates to or the likely consequences for the proper planning and sustainable development in the area or the effects on the environment or of a European site. Any reports obviously that were required to be submitted and any uh, oral hearing uh, reports that have been generated. Uh, the board must have regard or they consider um, the provisions of the development plan, the guidelines issued by any minister, the provisions of any special amenity, and there's a few other things there that it must have uh, regard to when it is making its decision. Um, section 9.3 then is very specific and it says when making its decision in relation to an application the board shall apply. So it doesn't um, consider these things but it must apply specific planning policy requirements which are referred to as SPPORs of guidelines that were issued by the minister. Where specific PP, uh, SPPORs uh, exist and they are different and they differ from the development plan, then those requirements to the extent that they differ apply instead of the development plan. And that's important because it comes up then again in the case law. Uh, in relation to the grant or the refusal under section 9.6, uh, the board may grant 
a permission that contravenes materially the development plan. But it cannot uh, grant a permission that materially contravenes the zoning of the land. So if a land is zoned for a particular purpose, it cannot materially contravene that, but it can contravene uh, aspects of the development plan. If the proposed development is going to contravene the development plan, then the board may only grant permission where section 37 of the 2000 Act applies. And you'll see there that I've included some of the aspects of section 37, which says the development is of strategic, strategic or national importance, or there are conflict, conflicting objectives in the development plan or objectives that are not clearly stated. Now that's something that comes up again in the case law that the board can grant permission that is in um, material contravention of the plan, but where the plan it, it, it says two different things, it needs to actually identify the fact that granting in one aspect is going to materially contravene uh, another bit of the plan and simply identify it and be aware of it at least. You'll see that coming up in the case law. So here are the recent cases that I was going to address and uh, I, I'm sure uh, you're aware I simply don't have time uh, to go through all of those, uh, but I'm going to focus on Redmond versus on board Planola and have a look at Heather Hill management versus on board Planola for reasons that will become uh, obvious. What I have done there is identified points of summary that have arisen through the case law. So um, one of those is that the special cost provisions under section 50B of the 2000 Act are available to applicants uh, challenging a decision to grant permission for a strategic housing development. And the key provisions um, under that act are that each, app, each party bears their own costs, which means an applicant isn't going to be made liable for the other side's costs if they lose. And further, that the costs may be awarded to an applicant to the extent that they are successful. So if they are successful, they're then in a position that they may be awarded their costs. And that's uh, great for um, keeping the board in check it means that people are uh, prepared and willing to bring these type of challenges without uh, being at huge risk of costs and since there isn't the two layered approach that you would normally have in relation to planning it keeps a check on these type of applications uh, the case law um, identifies that the development plan falls to be interpreted as it would be understood by a reasonably intelligent person having no particular expertise in law or in town planning. And this does not include examining a previous development plan to try and interpret the current plan. The interpretation of the development plan is a question of law for the court where there is a conflict between the objectives in the development plan, the board must cons consider whether the statutory criteria um, in section 37 arise. Uh, and if it doesn't, then the grant is ultra viris. So it's not simply allowed willy nilly um, materially contravene the development plan. Uh, where that where the deficiency in the planning process uh, prevented public participation or where it has been irregular from the very outset, then the decision should be remitted uh, and not set aside. Sorry, the other way around. The, the other way around, where the deficiency has prevented public participation or irregular from the outside, the whole decision should simply be set aside and it shouldn't be remitted back to the board. I'll fix that before these um, slides go out to you. So just then looking at Heather Hill management uh, in the first instance, the applicants contended that the proceedings attracted the special costs rules govern, 
governing environmental litigation set out in section 50b of the planning and development act uh, 2000 and or under the environment miscellaneous provisions act 2011 uh, and or seeking the court to exercise its inherent jurisdiction to limit the applicant's costs. The board and the developer submitted that the special costs rules only apply uh, where there's alleged breach of the Habitat Directive or the EU Flood Directive. Um, the board and the developer contended that the legal costs can be apportioned between the various grounds of challenge with different costs applying to different aspects of the case. So in other words, they said, look, even if you can use these special cost provisions, they mightn't apply to all grounds that have been used to challenge this decision. And the applicant shouldn't be insulated in respect of all costs of it and that the court should uh, enter a process of deciding which aspects attract the special cost provisions and which aspects don't and Mr Justice Garrett Simons disagreed with that and he essentially said that if any of the following statutory provisions um, gave effect if any statutory provision gave effect to one of the following eu directives and they're listed there out for you uh, that then the special cost rules apply and the court went on then to examine section 9 of the 2016 act which um is the section under which permission is either granted or refused and find that it imposes an obligation upon on board Pranola in respect of both the EIA directives and the Habitat Directive. More specifically, Section 9 1B obliges on board Pranola to consider whether an environmental impact assessment report or a Natura impact statement or both that report and that statement as the case may be submitted to the board pursuant to section 8. Uh, section 9.2 requires on board Panola in considering the likely consequences for proper planning and sustainable development to have regard inter alia to whether an area or uh, part of the area is a European site and whether it's going to have an effect on that site. So the court said looking at that it follows uh, that on its natural and ordinary meaning, Section 9 of the 2016 Act is a statutory provision that gives effect inter alia to paragraph 3 of Article 6 of the Habitats Directive. And therefore, Section 50B is triggered where the impugned decision gives effect to any one of those four EU directives. And it is thus sufficient to attract the special cost rules in those instances. The court held that the decision to grant planning permission was ultra vires as the proposed development would involve a material contravention of the development plan. And they said that was in relation to two aspects. One, it would breach the population allocation for Berna as set out in that development plan. And part of the application site lay in an area which had been identified as an area that was at risk of flooding. And Simon Jay noted that the development plan provided that proposals for development works in the areas were to be subject to a development management justification test and that that hadn't been done. The court held that if there is a conflict between two objectives of the development plan, it doesn't allow the decision maker to contravene one of the objectives and to dismiss that contravention as immaterial. The, no, the court noted that the solution which the Oireachtas had put in place was to address the contingency of conflict, conflicting objectives that is provided for under Section 37 of the 2000 Act. Um, i.e. the board Pernola is authorised to grant permission in material contravention of the plan. The court held that the board must first consider whether the statutory criteria in section 37.2b of the 2000 Act had been met and must indicate in its decision 
the main reasons and consideration for then contra, uh, um, contravening materially the plan. In this case, the court didn't think that there was a material contravention. And so, sorry, the board didn't think there was any material uh, contravention and therefore it didn't go about addressing those statutory requirements in section 37 because it simply didn't accept or consider that there had been any contravention. Um, so in a second case, uh, Heather Hill, the respondent sought leave to appeal under uh, section 50A and the court uh, considered uh, that none of the points of law argued were of public importance and additionally an appeal was not in the public interest. Um, so that is uh, the second of those. The next case that I want to have a look at is Redmond versus Ambor Pranola. And in this case, the lands in question uh, had originally been part of a very large site that was owned by a religious order and had been designated institutional lands. Uh, the religious had sold off a section of those lands that had been developed for residential housing uh, previously and they had retained then uh, a section of the lands with a convent, school still on it, a hockey pitch and tennis courts and it had sold the particular plot of land that was in dispute in this case uh, to the developer. Uh, the lands had been uh, designated institutional and the issue before the court was firstly uh, whether uh, they retained the designation institutional and if they did still retain this designation as institutional whether it was a zoning objective so just to be clear, uh, Ambor Pranola is not allowed grant planning permission uh, that materially contravenes a zoning objective. It can materially contravene the development plan, but not a zoning objective. So first of all, did the institutional designation stick? If it did, was an institutional designation a zoning objective and if it wasn't um well then they could materially contravene the plan but the question was had on board Pernola acted in material contravention of the plan in a way that they were allowed um so interpreting uh, the plan uh, first of all the court said that it has to be um a reasonably, you had to interpret the plan uh, in accordance with as if a hypothetical, reasonably intelligent person was reading the plan. So the court found that to have regard to a previous plan was inconsistent with that. So your ordinary person doesn't go about researching previous plans to see what they said and to see how they changed to be comparable with the current plan. So one of the things that they were doing when they were looking at this institutional designation was they were saying, look at the cursors or the symbols that were on the previous plan and how they changed in relation to this plan. And the court said, you can't do that because the ordinary person wouldn't be doing that. Uh, the court said that the interpretation of the development plan was a question of law for the court and therefore it didn't have to show any deference uh, to the views of the board in, in, in interpreting the plan. Uh, the court noted in relation to institutional use that it wasn't a personal thing or it wasn't dependent on ownership. So one of the issues that was raised in the case was institutional land was institutional when it was being used by an institution or for an institutional purpose, sort of like by a school, by a religious order for that purpose, but that when the land had been sold and it no longer had a school on it and it no longer was owned by a religious order, that it couldn't be institutional land. And the court didn't agree with that. The court said that um, 
the simple transfer of ownership could not change the designation of land. The court found, however, that the designation as institutional land didn't preclude the granting of planning for residential use. So it was within the zoning objective that uh, re uh, institutional land could be used for residential use. The court then went, went on um, to have a look at whether it had been a breach of the development plan. And the court found that the permission was granted in material contravention of the development plan in two respects. One in respect of housing density. So under the development plan, the housing density was identified um, to be 35 to 50 units per acre, whereas this development was about 67 units per acre. Um, now, the board was entitled to allow higher densities where it demonstrated that this could contribute towards an objective of retaining open character or recreation amenities that were set out under ministerial guidelines. So in other words, the, the board would have had to identify the ministerial guidelines and then say that this is why there was going to be a material contravention of the plan. However, the court said, um, that there was no suggestion that the board had made its decision having considered those issues, in other words, the minister's um, guidelines. Uh, and it had made its decision with no reference really to the open character or recreation amenities of the land. And the court found that the board had erred in finding that the density of 67 units was allowable with reference to the matters that it had rel relied on. The court also found that the planning um, did not comply with the minimum open space in the development plan. So you can see there what the court is saying is uh, if there is a way that the development plan can be materially contravened, the board has to identify that way. In other words, by reference to one of the things in section 37 or by looking at the special, special planning uh, policy requirements set out under ministerial guidelines. It can't simply just ignore the development plan. Um, the court found that the board had misinterpreted the development plan and that as the board is required under section 9 to have regard to the development plan, it couldn't be said that it had regard to something that it had utterly misunderstood. So the judgment in that regard is very, very damning of the decision from the board. Uh, Section 8 of the 2016 Act requires uh, the board to have regard to a report prepared by the Chief Executive of the Planning Authority when making its decision. And in this case, the Chief Executive's report had recommended that the planning permission be refused and had said that if it wasn't going to be refused, it had recommended 25 uh, separate conditions that it would impose. And the court found that there was nothing in the board's decision that showed that the chief executive's report had been considered in any meaningful way. So again, that's a very damning um, indictment from the High Court uh, about the board's decision. And it would identify that there is a possibility to challenge these decisions where the board doesn't set out the reasons uh, that it has come to the conclusions that it has Reference, referencing the things that the legislation requires us uh, to look at. David, am I coming to the end? I think we're a little bit tight for time, so we might ask you to, yeah, to wrap yeah. it up. Okay, so the only thing that I want to uh, wrap up then is to identify in the uh, slides that I have set out uh, a number of the different cases with a very, very short uh, summary in relation to those. Perfect. But most of them are really addressing the same type of issues that have arisen in Redmond. And I don't want to take up any more time because I didn't actually time myself and I meant to put on Very the Very good, Baba. Super, super. So thank you, it David. Is. 
a, a fantastically dense topic indeed, and uh, we could uh, devote an afternoon to it indeed. I'll hand over now to, uh, I might ask you to stop sharing, um, Beba, and uh, we can um, uh, we can then uh, we can uh, uh, we can then uh, move uh, move over to uh, that's great. We move over to Patricia. Hopefully, can, Patricia can activate her camera. So, uh, with apologies for our uh, attendees and indeed our panelists, we might uh, uh, keep uh, keep going a little bit over time with your indulgence. So, I'll hand over now to uh, Patricia, please. For some strange reason, uh, David, my camera, I'm, what does it say here? Uh, you can, the host has asked you to start your video. Okay. Oh, here I am. Great. That's great. Okay. So um, I'm going to keep this quite short. It was a very short um, presentation anyway. And it's basically, I wanted to share with everybody um, who is concerned with uh, an issue that arises when a developer uh, company is struck off the, um, which part of this I look at, but when a developer company is struck off the register of companies, uh, which often happens for various reasons and sometimes for failing to file tax returns, etc. And often, in fact, the owners management companies are struck off um, equally as frequently. But what do you do in that situation? And um, the effect of winding up of a company means that it's divested of its beneficial ownership in its assets. And so um, it cannot then deal with, if it's holding legal title to a property, it cannot deal with it, it cannot convey it, it cannot sell it, it cannot transfer it. So um, basically the message for me is that you don't have to go to the trouble of um, applying to have the company restored to the uh, CRO, uh, to the Register of Companies, um, and you don't have to go to, there's a relief that would be possible under section 708 of the Companies Act, whereby a court can um, make an order that the dissolution of the company was void. Um, and so the company could then deal with the transfer of the, the property. But um, specifically, I suppose we were concerned, just go back, it was, sorry, it went rushing into it. Um, basically, I suppose, put, when an owner's management company is formed under the scheme of disposal that, that's in place um, between a developer um, and the owner's management company, the owner's management company really must um, gain legal title to the common areas and title for those owners in the uh, units is not complete until that happens. And um, so the, they're basically the, message is that in Irish and in English law, the um, a company who holds property on trust for another is actually deemed to be a trustee that cannot be found. And normally, if a company is dissolved uh, or struck off and it holds legal title to property, that property vests in the state as bona vacantia, which anyway, it means um, the owner cannot be found basically. And um, so under normal circumstances, property in the ownership of a company will vest in the state. However, section 28 of the Property Act 1954 has an exception whereby, wherein if that property has been held in trust for another, that property does not vest in the state. And so the, when a developer is struck off, without having conveyed the legal title to the common areas, to the owner's management company or their management company that they've set up for management of the common areas, the remedy that I would recommend to people is to apply under section 25 and or section 26 of the Trustee Act 1893. It's actually quite a common application that's made. It's made in situations where um, there is restructuring internally and inadvertently one of the groups, one of the companies fails to um, transfer the land to another related company. Uh, and it also has happened, um, and in fact, it's a relatively uh, instructive decision, um, 1984 in the High Court here, where um, a couple had originally mortgaged their house to mortgage company A, mortgage company B sold on the mortgage and the right to sue under that mortgage to another company. Um, and when it eventually was sold more recently, the purchasers 
couldn't get access to legal title because it inadvertently hadn't transferred from the original mortgage company to the second mortgage company. And uh, in that case, again, the court found that um, the dissolved company was a trustee that could not be found. So um, re Heidelstone is uh, 2006, it's, I actually have it here, it's 2006 IEHC 408. That's the most instructive case we have on point uh, in this jurisdiction. Uh, it was a judgment of Lafoy, and it was recently followed and applied by Judge Allen in uh, a judgment which is found on the court's website. It was published there, if you want to take a note of it, on the 28th of April this year. Judge Allen, uh, Clariant AG and Clariant Plastics and another one in the Clariant Group. And again, that was a situation where there was a restructuring uh, internally. And um, during that restructuring process, one of the properties um, was inadvertently um, not transferred to the remaining companies in the group and the dissolved company had retained legal ownership to it. And again, Judge Allen followed um, Re Heidelstone, which was a case between the developers and the owner's management company and held that in that case, again, the company which was uh, holding the um, property and trust for the the other for the purchasers or for the other company uh, held that uh, held the legal title on trust for the beneficial owners and um, I suppose the most important thing to establish before you go to court making this application which is as Foy pointed out in Re Heidelstone in 2006 it's a much more expedient and cost effectively uh, cost effective application than uh, finding the directors and looking for them to restore their company, et cetera, and then convey. So section 25 allows the court to um, make an order appointing a new trustee. Um, but section 26 actually is probably the better go-to uh, section under which to apply to the court. And that is um, whereby the court can vest the property directly into the beneficial owner. So um, just to, I've flown through the whole thing because I know we're stuck for time, everybody will be going back to the office, but basically an application can be brought under section 25 and or section 26 of the um, Trustee Act uh, 1893 uh, in a situation where a developer company has been dissolved that developer company will have entered into an agreement to uh, convey the title to the common areas to the beneficial owners who are then the unit owners who purchase the units. And um, the just a few little things before you go to court, little proofs that you'll need are, first of all, that there was an agreement um, and that the statute of frauds is satisfied and that is that the agreement is in writing or is evidenced in the um, AGM or in any special EGM or SGM and um, or maybe recorded in the minutes of a, of, of a meeting and uh, that the purchase price has been paid um, in other words that the beneficial interest is established in the property. So there are a few proofs like that that you need before you get into the court to in order to satisfy the court that the property is actually held in trust. And I realise that we're totally out of time. <laughs> so um, that's it, I'll keep it brief. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Patricia, for that uh, whistle-stop uh, tour of the, uh, of the um, uh, issue in question in relation to uh, developers, etc. cetera, uh, being struck off, but much, much appreciated. Uh, we have a very limited time for Q&A and I can see that uh, Anita has kindly responded to a number of questions uh, directed uh, towards her and uh, indeed what we might do is, given the time constraints, we might take those um, questions, we have a record of them and we might uh, take them offline to uh, those who have submitted them with their, with their names. I know there's a couple of anonymous ones as well, but uh, we'll get back to people directly. Look, I think respecting, uh, respecting the time of, uh, of our, our uh, attendees and indeed our panelists, I might hand over briefly to Martin Waldron for any uh, last concluding remarks on behalf of the uh, Construction Bar Association. 
uh, and while Martin is coming online, um, I think Martin, you can probably um, yeah. turn uh, turn on your camera as well if you if you would oh, like. This time, can I? Uh, I think you probably can. Um, so uh, hopefully, uh, if if you wish to do that, that's that's great. Yeah. Excellent. There you are. Okay. So I'll hand over to Martin for concluding remarks, and we'll wrap it up shortly. Thank you, Martin. All right. Listen, I'd like to thank each of our three speakers for those excellent presentations I mean, from navigating the complexities of the statute of limitations and the decision in Brandley. It's a very live topic for all of us involved in construction disputes. And uh, Anita did a great job of setting it straight for, for the, the complex area of law that it is. Uh, over to the um, very live issues around strategic housing developments and something that I hope should be uh, used much and more and more in the industry to meet the housing shortfall that exists there and not to say that uh, and hopefully loads more disputes for uh, practitioners in the area but undoubtedly there will be and uh, finally uh, that this will stop tour of the trustee act and the mud act which is uh, a, a very live topic and that still exists due to the crash in 2008-9 and something that regularly comes across my desk and uh, very much appreciated to just get that, as I say, whistle stop tour, there's a lot more to be said in it. So there's a lot of food for thought there, hopefully assistance to people who have issues and uh, they know where to reach out to if they need further assistance from Construction Power Association uh, and uh, other practitioners in the uh, law library um, and uh, lawyers, of course. I'd like to thank David and the team at the Housing Agency for looking after all the organisational and technical side for the event and making sure it ran seamlessly as it did from start to finish. Uh, we we're really glad to partner with them uh, for this event and uh, that's something that we're looking to do with other organisations uh, throughout the year. We find that uh, collaboration in these events is suits everybody, uh, especially in these COVID times where it's very hard to pull people together and there's a, a, a lot of online events. So it gave a very comprehensive uh, presentations and I'm very happy to have been involved. Um, so if you want anything further on this, you can go on to the cba-ireland.com, follow us on Twitter. The housing agency will also have uh, information on their website. And we have a detailed program of technical talks planned for the le coming legal year, uh, which should be of interest to most of the people uh, on here. And we hope to see you all again soon. And I'll hand you back to David for his closing remarks. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks indeed, Martin. Thank you for that. Uh, appreciate, uh, again, the collaboration of, of the CBA, uh, the background work by, uh, indeed, Patricia, uh, Mema, Anita, uh, Deirdre and colleagues. Uh, and from my own perspective, my own colleagues, uh, Katrina Lawler, uh, Sarah uh, Kennedy, who was in the background helping us on tech, and indeed uh, Michael McHale, appreciate his time on the communication side as well. We'll wrap it up there. We'll remind you to contact us at mud at housingagency.ie. We will have seminars, uh, webinars rather later in the year and uh, various publications and events for uh, the OMC and mud sector. So please do uh, check out our website, website indeed, housingagency.ie. With that, I'll wish you all a very pleasant uh, afternoon. Stay safe, August Slon Tamil, Gurmila Mahagiv Galera.